Thank you very much, Shingo. Um, as I've been, uh, we've been talking about a bit earlier today, uh, my own organization has also pivoted uh, even more to digital. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so uh, I'm becoming, as uh, even though I'm a, I'm a top executive in my organization, uh, becoming uh, myself sort of more digitally uh, able. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, share my uh, my screen momentarily. So uh, I've been really looking forward to this. I think it's uh, it's it's a, a very um, interesting time we're in right now, and uh, in many ways it uh, accentuates uh, and puts really on the edge the role of. Um, both of designing and dealing with uh, creation and innovation in, in face of uncertain futures, but certainly also the role of, of leadership. And uh, what I'll try to share with you today is basically um, you know, some of my insights from um, from a sort of a, uh, my uh, original PhD research, but also from the work I've been doing for the last about 15 years in working with uh, design in various contexts. Um, this is one of my really favorite uh, quotes on, 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 the, on the challenge of designing. And um, this notion of uh, thrownness that uh, Dick Boland and Fred Colopy uh, are talking about in this quote uh, from the great book, Managing as Designing, it's a, it's a 2004 book, um, is, uh, is really, I think, uh, uh, timely. We are, and this is actually a quote, the, the, the idea of thrownness is originally from the philosopher Heidegger, it's basically the idea that we as human beings, when we are born or when we are put into, in, that we are, we are in, in, in management positions, are thrown into situations that we did not come up with. And um, even though we didn't come up with the situation and it's not our, uh, our idea, we have to deal with it. And this point about being responsible, um, being responsible for producing a desired outcome or perhaps even finding out what, what the outcome should be, is the task of the leader. And in the task of the leader, and it's almost, it almost feels, uh, uh, well, it feels very challenging that uh, we do operate in problem spaces where we not, don't always know what is the right thing to do, but we have to act. We have to proceed, as they say. And so that's a framing of connecting managers with designers or the job of managing with the job of designing because this um, situation of being faced with a task with a brief with a challenge and you have to do something about it that is also the task of the designer so here, here we see this convergence between managing and designing um, and actually i think that the the moment when ingo and i met the first time was actually at a course called the convergence of managing and and designing so this is, the, um, this is what we're thrown into right now. Um, and I think actually, interestingly, there are all these aesthetics around the coronavirus uh, that we see. This is maybe not the best one, but uh, it's one I, I, I found for actually from a Danish uh, daily. Um, and, and we're facing all kinds of unprecedented types of challenges, including the fact that probably most of us on this call are, 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 uh, are joining from home uh, and not from our usual place of work. I certainly am. And we also do have to manage and lead from the distance digitally, uh, which uh, in many organizations is, is new, even though the technologies have been with us for a very long time. So this is the framing, but I think uh, the points I will make, of course, are, you know, they're coming from a time before the coronavirus, uh, and they will also be relevant, I believe, the time when, when the virus hopefully is, 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 uh, is, um, is in the past. Um, because the work... I've been doing and the work we're doing at the Danish Science Center is really about more universal approaches to leading through complex, turbulent and challenging times. But before joining and going into that more, um, I'd very much like for you to break out just for five minutes uh, in small groups of two or three and discuss these two questions. Um, what are your examples of um, uh, leaders trying to cope with uncertain times? and what makes those leaders good. I'd love to hear your feedback on that and, and I'll ask Ingo to take care of the, of the quick breakout of five minutes. Right, so I'm setting up the breakout rooms right now. If you don't feel like going into a breakout room, you are more than welcome to stay with us in the main room. We will have a conversation here as well. For those of you who wanna go into a breakout room, you will have the option to do so in a second. 
and I open all rooms right now. If you end up with a breakout room by yourself, don't worry, I will move you to another room where there are actual people having a conversation. I'm just seeing people move into the rooms. Most rooms have like two people already. So if you want to move in, feel free. Okay, I'll give you some more time. If you're joining on a phone, you might be already have put into a room. Uh, let's see, there's somebody by herself. I will just take care of that. And uh, while we wait, Kristen, um, why yeah, I manage I thought, here? Yeah, I thought I might share an interesting story with you. Um, because a part of my job is I teach, uh, we teach uh, executive development uh, and uh, in design thinking, um, uh, including with, uh, in partnership with the Copenhagen Business School. And uh, recently I was teaching uh, the senior leadership of uh, the Danish National Railroads. So it's called DSB, some uh, colleagues, uh, those from Denmark uh, might know it, but it's basically our national rail service. And so uh, I was teaching design to the, the group of, uh, of senior executives um, as part of a, a, a bigger management training they were doing. And I thought to myself, I wonder if the Danish Design Center hadn't at one point written about design in, in that organization, because actually the DSB organization, the Danish Railroads, used to be known for great design. Uh, not only for its graphics and actually amazing posters and poster graphics, but also for its um, the architecture on the, the stations, its uh, graphics on the trains, its interior design and, uh, and services. And now this is a while ago. Uh, those who are living in Denmark will, will know that it's maybe not so today. And I, um, I went and I looked at the uh, library at the Danish Design Center and found a book from 1984 about design in the Danish National Railroads. And I look up in the book and it's actually written by the head of design in the company. And it's also, um, it has a foreword by the uh, secretary general of the railroad service, uh, which of course is partly publicly funded. And here is the thrilling thing about it. That uh, the foreword says, um, and uh, it says, there was a time probably a generation ago when nobody connected design and management. But at this time of age, in 1984, we all know, of course, that design and management are closely related. And it is the job of managers to use design to discover and find ways uh, and devise ways to create more value for, uh, for end users. Design is a way to connect all the functions of a company across all the different functionalities, including finance and marketing and HR and so on, to put the customer at the center. And I was actually reading this quote for the senior executive leaders uh, of, of the company, you know, uh, 35 years uh, later. And they were, they were slightly surprised, um, but it was a very nice way to start the conversation about design and management and design and leadership, because this is really in many ways, not a new conversation. Uh, it is a conversation that's always been taking place because leaders and top managers in organizations have taken um, and worked with designers, uh, either in external or internal designers, to devise ways of creating value in the marketplace or to find ways to develop their organization. Um, so I just wanted to share this slightly sobering um, uh, piece of uh, information because um, we are standing on the shoulders of many generations of designers and, and managers who have uh, worked in defining this space and also uh, with varying degrees of success um, uh, connecting leadership and design. That's a question here. Um, since we're talking about leadership and recognizing the role of design and how it can support us, um, what do you think influenced the um, managers back then and the managers that you're working with today to actually look at design? Yeah, so interestingly, um, You know, I think there are two very different situations, right? One is to, to look at design in a time of affluence. 
at a time when you are ambitious and visionary and where you um, want to create a great company. And you invest in design because you recognize that's important. Uh, back in the early 70s, the same happened at IBM, uh, the, uh, the IT company, and, and, and they became known uh, widely as a highly design-driven company. Maybe they lost their way a little bit up through the 80s, and now they, in some ways, are back. Um, the other story is the crisis, right? It's like, how do you respond to a crisis? And here, I think it's more difficult because many organizations do not look to design and designers um, or even design thinking in a broader sense when it comes to dealing with uh, these uh, shocks and, and crises that we see. Uh, around the global, the global financial crisis, we saw a lot of companies shedding their design functions or cutting them down. We saw innovation labs and teams being shut down and uh, um, and it was a quite challenging time there. So I think, uh, but, but I do think that design uh, methodologies and design leadership is extremely relevant at times of, uh, of uh, crisis and uh, the kind of turbulence we're seeing now where we need to look for novel ways, we need to challenge our assumptions and so forth. So I think there are these diff very different contexts um, and I think the challenge we all have right now is to help decision makers in, in business and government to see that this is a time uh, of crisis where we do need, you know, uh, structured, systematic, creative thinking. Uh, we need uh, ways uh, to bring us out of the crisis. We need to understand customer behavior better. And here designers can be a key part of the solution. Right. And I just want to... Uh say hello to everybody who joined us from the breakout rooms. So we are all back and uh, Kristen, I hand over back to you um, to continue with your session. Well, I hope you had a, a fruitful conversation in the breakouts and um, look forward to, uh, to uh, taking more Q&A towards the end of our session. Um, I'd encourage you actually along as we go along to, to comment or uh, put uh, your observations in the chats. It might be interesting actually just to um, if you do have names of leaders, uh, some that might be known even, uh, just throw them in the chat for all of us to see as uh, I start speaking. So you share your takeaways from, from the breakouts uh, with all of us as we go along. Um, uh, I might even uh, reflect on a few names if you drop them in. So just please uh, use the chat function. Ah, Shackleton, good one. Uh, actually, there's a wonderful, wonderful book about Shackleton's leadership, right? You might, you might know it. Um, oh, there we go. All kinds of great names. Just keep them coming. Um, and we've got one from the crisis right now, Cuomo. Um, these are all really, really interesting bets. So just uh, keep them coming and uh, I'll, uh, I'll start uh, continuing the conversation. So basically, what we do at the Danish Design Center is to work as a platform to advance design in, in, in business and society. And uh, we've been around since 1978. Hence, we've uh, published things all the way through the years, including back in 1984. I mentioned to some of you who heard that one about the Danish railroads. And we really think that uh, the bringing design to organizations is about empowerment. Um, it's about bringing the skills, the mindsets, the tools, and ways of thinking uh, to, um, uh, to uh, organizations and, of course, also to individuals. Uh, individuals that could be specialists or individuals that could be leaders. Uh, we work both with designers and, and non-designers, obviously. And we have sister organizations around the world, such as the Design Singapore Council or UK Design Council or um, our friends up in uh, Norway, Do Doga, and so forth. So we are part of a small you know, community of, of design centers or councils. Um, in our case, we are co-funded by the government, so we have a strong relationship to the Ministry of Business. Uh, we also have a historically strong relationship to the Danish uh, Confederation of Industry that uh, co-founded co-fund us originally. Uh, but we do work as an independent foundation today. So we work across society and across. Also, we work uh, quite a lot internationally. Uh, we do training. We do a lot of innovation programs. And we do uh, a lot of communication and, and sharing what we do. Uh, this is our little uh, uh, very humble home uh, on the waterfront in Copenhagen, that which we share with the Architecture Center and we share with number of other organizations and actually mainly this building is called blocks this ecosystem is focusing on on co-creating and co-designing our urban future so it has this particular building and its uh, residents many of them are focusing very much on on urban innovation and there's a particular focus there it's also partly focused for us but of course not exclusively as Ingo mentioned, uh, part of the, what I'll talk about today is from one of my books, you know, a few other ones, but the one called Leading Public Design uh, has a number of the insights in that book, which I'll share today as well, which are also in the HBR piece. So if you want to just read only 12 pages, we can read the HBR piece that Ingo will share. 
if you want to read the, the longer one, you can read the blue book uh, called Leading Public Design. And if you are, you really want to, uh, um, uh, really want to go all in, you can read the PhD behind it, which is also online. It's a 400 page PhD at, at Copenhagen Business School. So here's, um, here's a little quote from another leader. Uh, I don't see whether anyone got him on the list. Nope, not really. So um, here's Franklin uh, Roosevelt. And the story goes that when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was running for election, so he was a candidate uh, for, for the presidential election of 1932. And 1932 is an interesting period uh, because uh, many of you will recognize that that was a time when the United States certainly, but also part of the rest of the world, was in a deep, deep crisis. It was a crisis where I think about a quarter of um, adults in America were unemployed. Uh, and the Great Depression was leaving its mark across the country. Uh, and here we have a, uh, a leader who says, um, the approach I propose is experimentation. In fact, uh, at the speech which uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave to a university in Georgia as part of his election campaign, um, he said, um, uh, you know, basically my political platform is let's just try something. And that is uh, unusual for those of you at least who know political leaders uh, but also I would say leaders in, in business to say, uh, my best bet is we, we got to try something. Um, of course, he says, well, if we fail, we try something different. And uh, in my mind, that is absolutely design thinking uh, and uh, design leadership uh, going on here. But we have to recognize that it's not an easy thing to say something like that. And actually, here's the quote from his um, his uh, personal uh, uh, political advisor who was actually not present when he gave the speech and his personal advisor also did not endorse the speech or even write it. This was something that Delano Roosevelt put into uh, the speech himself. So here's the quote from his advisor. And so the, the challenge to a leader who says, I'm willing to try something even though I'm not sure it works. Uh, well, there's certainly a challenge there. And we very rarely see political leaders say that. Uh, we also, uh, I don't see, we say that very often in, in business. But in the time of massive crisis, like the one we are finding ourselves in right now, maybe that is the best approach. Um, I recently wrote a, a short piece, which you can also find online, about um, this question of when the top executive fails on purpose or recognizes that he or she might fail. And this image is of the Danish Prime Minister, Mette Frederiksen, uh, who, by the way, has been mentioned uh, together with one of the other names you have dropped uh, in the breakouts, namely Jacinda Ardern, Ardern uh, from New Zealand, as a female leader of a state who seems to be right now handling the crisis relatively successfully. And here's a quote uh, from, uh, from, uh, from that article I wrote recently about her. Uh, because she said in a, in a, in a press briefing uh, online on television uh, a few weeks back that we cannot wait for the evidence. We cannot wait until we are sure what will work. We are going to make mistakes. I am going to make mistakes. And so again, we have a leader here who just like uh, Roosevelt uh, says, I will make, uh, I'm going to make mistakes. We're going to have to try. By the way, uh, Roosevelt uh, not only got uh, elected in 1932 and started as president in 33, but Roosevelt was also the longest sitting president in American history. Uh, actually, he was sitting so long as a president that uh, they had to change the, uh, the, the regulations. So you can only have two terms in America. He had three. I don't know whether that will happen for the Danish prime minister um, uh, in, in view of the crisis and how she's handling it. Uh, certainly, she's been actually. Uh, highly regarded and respected for, for, for this quote and for her, her honesty and transparency in handling the crisis. Um, and, and what are the lessons we can take from that in terms of design? Well, here are a few uh, quotes also from, from my article, uh, the recent article on LinkedIn about the, the um, Danish prime minister's point, but also actually relating back to Roosevelt. Point number one, under conditions of high uncertainty, we can't have full knowledge. And if you pretend otherwise, you know, that might be dangerous. And in the design field, you know, that's a thing we're used to. We are used to building rough prototypes. We are used to learning from feedback. We're used to adjusting our approach as we uh, work to, to create uh, services and products and uh, new types of systems. 
Secondly, for managers in government and in business, taking this design attitude is essential if you're going to move forward and make decisions in spite of turbulence, which means you have to have the, the humility to know that you might fail fully or partly, but you must also have this will to execute, to go forward, to act, uh, to proceed, uh, and that takes some courage. And thirdly, we may in this time of turbulence actually want to listen more to those leaders who um, admit they don't know the path ahead. And those are the ones we want to follow rather than the ones that seem as if they're very certain. Maybe we want to follow leaders, especially because they admit they do not uh, know the path ahead. So this is very sort of pointedly focusing on the, on the current situation, but I wanted to take us a bit uh, sort of uh, uh, higher level and take a look at what is design leadership more generally when we talk about leading through a crisis uh, in terms of potentials and, and pitfalls. Uh, and when I say potential and pitfalls, it's because some of the research that I've done and also the uh, key points in the, in, the, um, in the article from Harvard Business Review that uh, we'll share are about what makes it difficult to lead uh, with design or lead in a design-driven way. So this is the piece and um, it has a slightly arrogant title. I apologize for, for this sort of the right way. I don't know that there is a right way, but we are trying to propose uh, Robert Austin and I as a, a way to lead design thinking um, and give some advice based on other leaders experiences. And what we say here is that design thinking is challenging because it involves something more than just managing change because design ultimately is about discovering what kind of change is needed. And this is in many ways at the heart of the shift we've seen in the narrative about human-centered design, strategic design, design thinking, and so forth, that we've been become much better at articulating over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, but which has always been at the heart of design practice, it's about questioning assumptions, challenging the status quo, challenging the brief, not only putting uh, aesthetics and graphics and, and form and shape to something that's taken for granted, but questioning functionality, questioning use, questioning value, and so on, discovering what kind of change is needed, discovering what might be valuable to someone. And that, of course, makes the leadership challenge more difficult because then it's not painting by numbers anymore. It's about uh, uh, discovery. Uh, it's about trial and error and all those things. I've, um, I've sometimes likened this to uh, taking a, 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 a walk or run uh, on a curvy path uh, through a dense forest. This is actually an image from, from my own uh, close neighborhood here. And I can tell you these days, uh, uh, they actually closed down this, uh, this pathway because of the virus that people were walking too, uh, too closely. You can see it might even be dangerous working too closely on, on this path. But taking a path where you can't see the objective, you can't see the end, you can't see where you're heading, you can't see where you're going. Um, navigating through some uh, some some uh, something that's quite uncertain, and where you may also not really know uh, what will get you there, uh, what are the means by which you'll get there, having you know to lead in a, in a in a situation where you don't really see the objective and you don't really see the means either. That is a double challenge of leading in with design. These two gentlemen here have had some interesting points uh, to this end, and I'll just use them as a segue to, to, my, to my, my, my presentation. But to the left, you see uh, Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winner, who wrote a, a book on design in 1969 called um, The Science of the Artificial. And in his book, The Science of the Artificial, he really articulates um, very well the power of design across many different professions. Um, he also, in that book, but also especially later on in his career, frames design as a question of ultimately making decisions and choosing between different options um, and, and framing design as decision making. And opposed to that, a quite different notion of design is from Buckminster Fuller, uh, the American inventor and architect, who said, Design is really about future making. It's about how we shape uh, our planets. It's about how we shape our societies. And design is, is in that way very open. Uh, our future is there for the making. It is not so we just have to choose between different so pre-existing choices. We have to, so to speak, craft the choices ourselves. So that leads to in a position really saying that one question is what decision should I make as a leader, as a manager? 
the bigger question might be, or the design question might be, what should I even be making a decision about? What is, the, what, what is it we need to discover? Or to put it even more sort of clearly that you can either take a decision attitude to problems where you would ask about evidence, what's the current situation, what's, what decision should I make, and where you really choose a decision, somehow believing that the choices are out there somewhere. Or you can take a design attitude to leading and leading as designing, where you ask questions such as, what's the problem? What's the opportunity space? What might be a better future situation? How can we expand and diverge and have more options to decide about? Ultimately creating the decision or at least creating the decision space. And here, for those of you who are not coming from the management side or are leaders yourselves, this is all about framing management or leadership as, as the practice of taking decisions, which is a big part of leadership and certainly one way to frame it. Now, let's not forget design practice as we dive into this. And just to just pull us into that space, one way, and then there are so many different models, so many, you know, double diamond models out there. But to simplify things a little bit, I'd just say that we can look at design approaches, design methodology, you could also say design thinking in three different dimensions. One is to explore the problem space, uh, what characterizes a challenge or a problem or an opportunity from a human perspective. The second one is to co-create new solutions. And again, some creating processes are individual, uh, star designers and so forth. Many uh, processes these days are collaborative, they're co-designed, they're co-creation, bringing in different voices and users, customers, partners in, in the mix. We see that in service design and so forth. And finally, of course, designers, they give shape and form to something that will exist in the future. So making the future concrete, taking abstract ideas and concepts and giving them form and shape. Um, that can be in the digital world, it can be in the physical world, it can be a small scale, it can be big scale. It can be a, it can be a systems level and mixing different artifacts and systems. But basically, that is the job of designers. So if you bear with me that these are sort of design practices, design um, uh, methodologies and approaches and we could we could expand each of these three domains into all kinds of methods and tools that you are well aware of but if we attach leadership practice to that uh, which is what I did in, in my PhD research we have these three practices and those are the three practices I'll, I'll spend the rest of the presentation looking into namely the practice and the leadership behavior of leveraging empathy the behavior of navigating uncertainty and ambiguity and the behavior of rehearsing the future of dealing with open futures and allowing for this trial and error experimentation and testing uh, as we, we build and refine products or services that will work in the future. So here are the principles one, two, and three, and I'll go through each of them uh, sort of uh, step by step. And as I do so, I'll also uh, reflect on, on both a couple of cases, but also what makes this very hard? So first of all, leveraging empathy. And here you can say that using designers' empathy and rich data and insight about customers or citizen behavior and experience and what's meaningful to people and so on, that really does challenge organizations and it challenges leaders. Because employees that are long accustomed to being told to be rational and objective and not bring their feelings and emotions into the workplace, these methods can be quite subjective and personal. So what do we do as leaders, as managers, when we bring in with design work, affection and emotions that can feel very overwhelming? How do you as a manager that leads a team of people allow for this material to be used in ways that are fruitful and constructive and don't feel like blame. And here, what I mean by that is that very often design research into how customers or users experience a service or existing product shows that the organization is failing. The organization is not good enough. Uh, the products are not meaningful. The user journeys are full of uh, frustrations and error. And so we, as we dive into design practice, 
we almost always challenge the status quo. We almost always challenge what's uh, going on. There's always something that could be done better. No strategy and no service, no product really does survive meeting reality. So here's an example of a nurse, a head nurse, a leader, a manager from the Danish National Hospital who um, uh, did a design uh, uh, project, uh, worked with the design team, uh, harvested ethnographic research about uh, patient experience and where the insights and the takeaways were you know, quite challenging. Uh, patients were um, not treated the way the staff probably intended. There was uh, waiting times that were you know, not meaningful. There was uh, frustration. One example was a customer, a, a patient, older lady that was rushed in by ambulance to the hospital and placed um, and with a heart condition. This is, this is the heart clinic of the Danish National Hospital. And the patient ends up in a chair sitting in the waiting room for three hours waiting to be, to be attended to. And the reason that happened was basically that the professional staff in, in, the, in, this, uh, in the clinic uh, could very quickly see from, from this uh, old, old woman uh, that she was not going to die. Uh, she was probably going to be fine at least for a few hours so they could let her sit and wait in the waiting room but they just didn't tell her. And so the user experience uh, was not that good. And these kinds of stories were multiple over the course of, of design research, observation studies, and so on. So what the nurse did as a leader, as a manager here, was to take the audio recordings, the clippings, and the voices, the sounds of patients telling their stories and sharing it uh, in, a, in a quite uh, powerful way with her staff. So she invited uh, 40 uh, participants to a, a seminar workshop and basically uh, started out by uh, with leveraging empathy uh, by playing back uh, these sound bites of citizens, of patients, uh, sharing their concerns and challenges one by one by one by one. And as the quote says here, she wanted to disturb the staff, she wanted to push them, she wanted to show them how even as very, very skilled doctors and nurses, they were really failing in many ways to deliver a service that was uh, meaningful and coherent and um, empathetic uh, with the customers. Um, so the leadership behavior here is, of course, to you know, push the organization, but it is also to leverage the empathy to generate change and a momentum around change. And this, this was the intent, and this is why I see what happened in this case example because the uh, leadership team, the head nurse and the head doctor could then work with the staff to uh, transform services, uh, bring patients in for shorter times, get them out again quicker, uh, provide much more transparent information. By the way, also redesign the waiting room uh, physically and by reorganizing services, cut costs so that only 50% of the patients uh, had to stay overnight in the hospital and of course generating a massive cost saving and a much more fluent uh, service journey for patients. So what this says about leadership is that as leaders leveraging empathy, you have to endorse processes, which of course involve information and, 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 and qualitative data about customers or users, but also to support employees who are dealing with distressing emotions. So in this case, providing, for example, uh, the next steps in the project, these are the things we can do involving people in co-creation of the transformation of the service processes and so on, but also um, be supportive and helping people tackle the new insights individually. And that is part of the leadership challenge, leading teams. Um, and then finally, I think it's really important to frame new findings as opportunities for redesign. And these days with the coronavirus with us, I can see that many leaders are going to have to find new opportunities for redesign. In some cases, they will have to be anchored in insights about very, very different customer behavior, behaviors that have changed because of the crisis and behaviors that may actually change also for the long term. So here, the leadership job becomes to frame those behavioral changes as opportunities rather than as, uh, as only as challenges. And of course, the reflecting question you might think about as I go on with the presentation is how would you, what could you do as a leader or how could you work with leaders in your own organization to leverage empathy? What would, what would be your uh, approaches? What would be your takeaways? What kind of ideas spring to mind? You can do that, note that down for yourself. Or you can share that uh, in the chat. The second 
leadership behavior is about encouraging divergence and navigating ambiguity. And we can certainly say that we are finding ourselves right now in this kind of transitionary space with the crisis, uh, at least in many sectors and many industries. It also goes for my own uh, own organization right now. We are following government rules uh, as a government funded organization. So we are all working from home uh, and finding ourselves as a very, very distributed organization. And that leaves us in, in, in some kind of space, which you might call the, uh, it's called the neutral zone, at least according to the uh, William uh, Bridges, he's an author who wrote a book called Transitions. And, and this idea of the neutral zone is kind of nice. Neutral zone is what happens between an ending and a beginning. And in a way, the way society function has ended for a while, and we still don't know how it will begin again and what that beginning will look like. So right now we find ourselves in the neutral zone, as William Bridges would, uh, would call it. And that means we have to navigate this uh, ambiguity. Um, when it comes to design methods, um, iteration, uh, co-creation, uh, uh, bringing in multiple uh, stakeholders in collaborative workshops and so on, we're asking people to, and this goes to employees in the organization, to not converge too quickly. We're asking people to, in a sense, go sideways for a while rather than to just move forward and jump at a solution. And holding that space, uh, that can go for product development or service design. It can actually also go, go for strategy processes where you hold a space and you hold attention for longer than is comfortable. And that puts pressure on leaders and on leadership um, that if people will say to you, well, we're just spinning our wheels. We're not going anywhere. Why are we co-creating? Why are we taking time on this? Why are we spending resources on this? But the leadership job here is to insist that we are holding the tension and we are working on discovery here. We are trying to find out what is the problem we're looking at uh, what are the directions we need to look in? Uh, we may be beginning early to prototype and so forth, and we need to be in this space. An example could be from a, a care institution in Denmark where the, the manager um, said, well, for him, it was like searching in the dark, um, groping along in the dark for some direction as this institution was grappling with insights from designers. Here was a design team from the design school in Kolling in the design school in southern Denmark which had uh, provided the insight to this organization that they, they were really not very hospitable to their users and certainly not to uh, visitors to the institution. Uh, as visitors came into the institution, there were no seats for people to sit in. So, um, and, and the design team asked, well, why aren't there any seats, any sofas, couches, places to sit when you have uh, visitors to the, uh, to the users here, which were uh, adults uh, and, and younger uh, mentally and physically handicapped people. And um, the uh, response, of course, uh, ultimately was, well, the reason that there are no places to sit is that nobody ever visits. So there are no visitors. And um, there are no visitors to people who are for life uh, put into this institution uh, because of a, a mental or physical handicap. So the question became, what direction to take? How might we again become, how might we be a place that invites in society, invites in relatives, invites in local communities, invites in uh, any kind of relations? How might we even design new relationships for people who are in this situation? And um, that was a process of searching, uh, groping along in the dark for a while until this notion of designing relationships actually became the direction. So by that, um, what should leaders do? Well, uh, encourage uh, divergence and navigate ambiguity. That means uh, insist that we are in this space, but also help staff to resist the urge to converge quickly uh, and help the goal-oriented people to deal with their insecurities and find them to lead by example. Show your own vulnerability. Show that you might be uncomfortable as well, but um, uh, insisting that we should trust this open-ended uh, process uh, and see that as a benefit, not as a lack of direction. So that is about encouraging divergence, navigating ambiguity, and you can again, as a takeaway, as a reflection uh, on your own or share it in the chat. Think about how can you support divergent thinking and handle the ambiguity in your own organization. And this, of course, is really on the edge right now with the crisis. Finally, the third practice is about rehearsing new futures. And you can say, of course, this is the domain of designers. 
but as managers and leaders who want to innovate, who want to transform, who want to change, they too have to uh, engage with the rehearsal and the prototyping of new futures and step into that space, just like the Danish prime minister did, just like uh, Roosevelt did, just like many of the leaders that you have pointed at uh, are doing uh, as they deal with the crisis. So here is the problem or the challenge in learning to fail forward. Uh, because what we're asking organizations to do and employees to do is to embrace failure. Or of course we can call it embrace learning, but sometimes you know design work does feel like failure. Iterative prototyping testing works best when it produces negative results. Actually, in good prototyping and good co-design, we produce and create artifacts that are designed to fail because they elicit better responses and more insights than artifacts that look like they will work. Um, but piling up seemingly unsuccessful outcomes doesn't really feel good to most people. So how do you deal with that as a leader, as a manager, that bringing in a design team and, and bring this type of process to your staff, to your organization, perhaps even across your organization? And here I like this quote. Uh, I sometimes use it in, in other parts of, of, of my, my presentations, but I wanted to share this one with you because both basically what you do when you prototype and you share something that may very well fail is that you lose control. And loss of control is almost the opposite of managing. You have this idea, at least in classical management uh, and administration theory, it's all about exercising control, right? But here we're losing control, at least for a while. We're losing control through the co-design processes. We're losing control when, when we allow for new insights and we are losing control when we allow for testing and prototyping. In this example from a community college, uh, the leader allowed for a group of uh, teachers and academics to, to develop a new curriculum in, in cross-functional groups or cross-professional uh, groups. Uh, and the staff at one point came up to her and said, are, are you really not trying to control us? Are you really comfortable with us doing this? And she said, yes, I'm actually uh, pretty comfortable with not being comfortable. Uh, and this is, I think, great, great leadership to, to, uh, to say this and admit that, uh, that it's a loss of control, but actually be so courageous that you see that as something, uh, something positive. So here, Rehearsing the New Futures is about enabling testing. It's about addressing the skepticism about the value of work, uh, even as that work is failing, apparently and being specific uh, about the kinds of overall outcomes that of course we're looking for. You know, we're looking for outcomes that might be about um, creating a world-class hospital or world-class clinic. We're looking for outcomes that are about creating good lives for people who are, are handicapped, or perhaps the outcome is to create a thriving and learning environment for students. Those high level outcomes, those high level ambitions can absolutely be there at the same time as you struggle to find out more clearly what are the objectives we should be pursuing, what are the strategies, what are the products, what are the services, what are the means. So have a focus on creating value and also not only focusing on creating value through um, the artifacts you build ultimately just for end users, customers, but also for staff within the organization so that you really work in, in a design uh, approach on both sides, internally and externally. So here's the final reflection you might take at home with you, uh, rehearsing new futures. Well, what would it look like if you rehearse new futures in your own company, in your organization? Uh, what would be the leadership challenge there? What are the leadership challenges you perhaps are see seeing already now? As, as in particular, as we see a lot of organizations right now in the crisis, struggling to find ways to discover what their future should even be, uh, as their customers have largely disappeared, as their funding has disappeared, as they have to look into new types of markets or new types of, of roles. I want to end with this question of design attitude that I started with. Uh, again, back to this excellent book by Boland and Carlopy. Uh, I work closely with Dick Boland for my, my thesis as well. And, and, uh, and he's, a, he's a wonderful uh, person also who wrote, uh, amongst others, this, this quote on, on design attitude. And really right now in this kind of crisis, how do we look for opportunities for invention? How do we look for ways where we challenge our assumptions and where we as leaders, but also as individuals and as uh, people in organizations, ask ourselves, how can we create an even better world than we found? And that can feel really difficult right now, but I do think that that is the task uh, ahead of us. Uh, thanks for listening. I look forward to a Q&A. We have about uh, 12, 13 minutes uh, left of the session for that. 
Um, if uh, you want to take this one away with you, you can do that. Uh, what kind of advice do you want to give others about becoming a design leader? And uh, that might be uh, be one uh, you can you you can you can take with you. So that happens a lot. Uh, government reacts to crisis by adopting all kinds of regulations, and then when the crisis or the problem is over, those regulations stay in place. There's an ex actually an excellent piece in Financial Times by Yuval Harari, the uh, author and uh, of, of great books like Homo Deus. And in that article in the FT about the crisis, he, said, he gives an example of a regulation that was put in place in Israel after one of the, the many wars there in the region and it was about for some reason you know you couldn't eat porridge or couldn't sell porridge for some reason in in israel and that uh, was adopted you know maybe maybe in the 1960s um and uh, it wasn't uh, absolved until 2014. Uh, strange, strange little example but but I, I totally see your point i'll say in denmark i see this happening that in managing the crisis right now in many government agencies, it's been a very, very small circle of people who have worked extremely hard 24 seven for several weeks in somehow dealing with things. And when it comes to one of the areas I work a lot with business policy, simply stop the bleeding, stop the bleeding, put in place economic stimulus packages, get that done. And in those that, that work, there has been not much space for any design thinking iteration or, and so on. And maybe that is, all right. However, right now, many countries are moving into a new phase, which is about how do we restart society? How do we restart business? And now we need to be creative. Now we need to uh, open up our minds about what might be possible and, and uh, stimulate innovation, uh, really. And here I can be worried that it'll be the same people uh, who, uh, who work so hard to stop the bleeding and, and just react and respond, who now need to, to shift into a very, very different gear which I don't know that they're so well equipped to. And of course, that's where we as an organization and others, I think, need to step in. Um, so anyway, yeah, I totally really see what you're saying. And there's a really big risk of that right now. Listen, we have a couple of uh, questions here in the chat and I'm just gonna like read them out as they come. And maybe you can just give us your thoughts on it. So the first one is from Suzanne who asked, how do we help notch acceptance of ambiguity within strict structures? Yeah, so, so, so organizations are designed to kill ambiguity, right? They're designed to uh, eliminate uh, divergence and uh, risk and uh, great feelings of control. I think in some ways with your question, I think, and Ingo and I actually talked about that earlier today, part of it is about mindset and psychology about who, who are leaders and, and who we choose as leaders, uh, if we can, um, and, and how we recruit people that have a more sort of, uh, T-shaped mindset, divergent mindset. But part of it is also about organizational design because the, the control is an illusion in many ways. Um, and, and, and new thoughts about the future of organization, uh, and this is not new, I mean, that's about 10, 15, 20 years, are all about more networked, more adaptive, more uh, decentralized, distributed organizations, uh, value-based organizations, and so on. And I think part of this handling ambiguity is also about how we organize ourselves. And then, of course, it's a question of how about leaders, they talk about ambiguity because you can try to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist and pretend you can control it, or you can embrace it and, and deal with it and, and recognize it. And I think from, from, from a leadership perspective, that's the point that you actually call it for what it is and, and you invite the organization to have some degree of comfort with it. Great. And I think that speaks also to the point of Julia, who said like uh, earlier in the chat, to which extent is um, control actually an illusion? Uh, the other question that Julia had was, um, you use management and leadership interchangeably. interchangeably. Uh, do you make a distinction purposefully? If so, why? Yeah. So I'm, I'm well aware of the distinction that we, we there's often used in literature between management on the one side and leadership on the other side. So for those who are not familiar with it, the idea of management is the administrative side, the, the sort of traditional roles of, of, of uh, organizing and administering an organization. And leadership is about uh, visioning, about motivation, about generating um, movements, uh, uh, generating followership uh, and so forth. And I'm on the one side aware of the distinction. On the other side, when you look at the literature on, on, on design and, and managers or leaders, we, we see the framing of, of managing as designing. 
And here things get a little bit blurred because in my mind, it's actually very much about leading as designing. And in my own writings and my own books, I usually use the term leadership uh, instead of management. So I, it's, I will say, short answer, that I've used the two terms interchangeably. But I would also say that much of what I talk about is leadership. And it is how design thinking and design work can empower even better leadership. And I'm personally a, more of a favor of, of leadership than of, of management. I think also one thing that you said earlier was this idea of like organizations are designed to um, kind of defy uncertainty or not embrace it, right? So to manage risk basically. And, um, but I think what is underlying in that um, statement is also that there might be a time for that calls for one versus the other. Yeah. And so the question here uh, that I'm picking up from Joanna was, uh, what are key signs to indicate that it's time to converge and you uh, have remained, when you have remained divergent? So when it is, is it time to be one? When is it time to be the other? And how can you de develop that awareness? Yeah, so on the one side, I think from, a, from an organizational perspective, from sort of the macro perspective, we have to have organizations that can do both that can diverge and that can converge at the same time, that can work on innovation and, uh, and, and futures and, and the next, and they can also uh, run uh, its operations and harvest value, extract value uh, in the current situation. That's also called many other things. Uh, John Carter, who wrote uh, Leading Change, he also called it the uh, um, uh, dual engine uh, organizations uh, in his book, Accelerate. Uh, another one a term is the ambidextrous organization that's been coined. Uh, I actually heard a really interesting example a few days ago that the government in, in Victoria, the state of Victoria in Australia, have created a, a split in government. So they have uh, those who run the government and then those who, ru those who re respond to the corona crisis. And each agency or department is essentially split into those two. So you have a multiple mode organization. I think that's at the organizational side. On, on, the, on the more sort of processual one, these things can be so different. So I, I, you can never put a timeline or sort of a process diagram on these things in terms of divergent convergence in, in concrete design work. But I'd say that's also the art and practice of designers and maybe also of design leaders to understand when are we in a divergent mode and when do we need to converge and be comfortable and, and aware of those, those phases. But that's a, a processual perspective. Hmm. And so, Given that, we have like two more questions here that I want to address. Um, do you have ideas on how to bring more of that? You talked about the, uh, diverge, uh, the ambidextrous organization. And um, do you have any others, other ideas on how to bring design management and this uh, ability to lead into this uncertainty into organizations, especially uh, when it comes to creating green organizations? And when we say green, I'm wondering if we mean uh, sustainable organizations. Uh, yes. In that place. Yeah. Well, sustainability is, is, is a massive focus for us I, I, as well. And, and uh, I mean, when you look forward on this one, that is going to call, that whole shift for society is going to call for, for a lot of innovation, a lot of transformation. And, um, and we, have, for example, we run a program right now called Green Circular, um, which is about bringing uh, design thinking to 80 companies in building circular business models across Denmark. So it's something we are really concerned with. I, I think in what, some ways the green challenge uh, is in, in some ways similar to so many other challenges we've faced over the years, uh, that we are looking at a potential for transformation. We're also looking at risks and design thinking and design methods, design leadership can help us address them. I think the wider question becomes, how do we embed the design skills within organizations to, um, to in a sense, empower leadership? Because most managers or, or you know, organizations are not designers and, and will never be you know, design educated. Some will, and that would be great, but they will need to access design resources, access professional designers, get them into the leadership teams, get them into the boards even, work with external consultants and so on. And I think there's still a, a, a ripe space. There are great books around. One is um, a book I was checking out recently about uh, it's this one here. It's called uh, Design Thinking at Work. I'll recommend it. It's uh, um, a David Dunn, Dunn's book about um, organizing design thinking in organizations. Uh, but we need to do more work on that. So just so everybody takes this away, what I see is great, good leaders 
empowered by great designers in, in teams internally and externally who, who are bringing those skills into the organization, also in, in making more green organizations. Perfect. And um, like there were a couple of other questions, but here just a quick reminder as we approach the full hour, we will share the recording later on and we will also share the link to the recording in an email to you where Kristen will be CC. So if you have questions, you can directly answer to that email and Kristen will get your question. Kristen, as a last question that uh, came here um, and it popped up two times, how might we exploit the crisis to bring more of that kind of thinking to organizations. Yeah, my good friend, uh, Martin Stewart Weeks, wrote a nice uh, piece recently, also I can share it online, about uh, is there an innovation dividend from, from the crisis? And, and I think there is, we see it already. We see government organizations being much more agile and speedy than they have been. Uh, some say they've done in three weeks what normally would take three years. Uh, we see organizations pivoting to digital very quickly. Uh, many will, I don't think, return to their usual way of working anytime soon, uh, simply because it's smarter to work that way. People will stop uh, traveling around the world necessarily for every conference and maybe do more digitally. So I think we're seeing, uh, we are seeing the innovation dividend from the crisis already. I think the bigger question is strategically for organizations, how do they see themselves uh, uh, just a year from now? So uh, uh, those of you who are Danes, I'll invite you to, to uh, join our, we're doing a survey right now about uh, scenarios for 2021, which is not normally the scenario horizon you use when you do foresight, but we're saying 2021 is totally open. We have no idea what that'll look like. Come help us uh, qualify that. So I think we need to be much more, more open about the future than we have been. And I'm really excited to see which organizations will, will grab that innovation dividend. I'm sure it's there.